On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with a neuroscientist, Dr. Mario Beauregard, about his new book, Brain Wars. There eventually will be uh, another revol- a big revolution in science, uh, and this will uh, be about uh, mind and consciousness. And the same kind of uh, revolution that they've had uh, about 100 years ago in physics, from classical physics to quantum physics, at the same time, in parallel, of course, like you said at the beginning of the interview, if you talk to lay people, uh, to most people, they do not believe that they are strictly biological robots, that they don't have any influence over their brain activity or what's happening in the body and so on and so forth. And so it won't be difficult uh, if there's uh, the, the start of a, really a, a transition in science, within science, uh, it will go uh, quickly uh, because the rest of the world, um, you know, is very sympathetic regarding a non-materialist view of uh, consciousness and of human life. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we're going to talk to Dr. Mario Beauregard about his fascinating work in his very compelling book, Brain Wars. So on this show, we've talked quite a bit about the end of materialism and the evidence for that, which has been mounting and is pretty overwhelming at this point. Well, here's a guy who's really pulled all that together in a way that really creates quite an overwhelmingly convincing case for anyone who dares to look. Here's my interview with Dr. Mario Beauregard. Today, we welcome Dr. Mario Beauregard to Skeptico. Dr. Bogart is an associate research professor at the Neuroscience Research Center at the University of Montreal. He has a PhD in neuroscience, also from the University of Montreal, and he also has two postdoctorate fellowships in experimental neuropsychology. He's the author of over 100 publications in neuroscience, psychology, and psychiatry, and he's here today to talk about his latest book, Brain Wars the scientific battle over the existence of the mind and proof that will change the way we live our lives. Mario, thank you very much for joining me today on Skeptico, and welcome. Thanks, Steve. So your book, Brain Wars, and this battle over, over whether we are really just biological robots, as our friend Stephen Hawking likes to say, is a frequent topic on this show. So I think you're going to find an audience who is well aware of a lot of the issues. But you really do a great job of kind of presenting it in your book and pulling it all together. Can you tell us a little bit briefly about what your book is about? Well, uh, the, the starting point is the uh, what we call the, the modern scientific uh, worldview. So it's the the worldview that is based on uh, classical physics, and this uh, this view is based on a number of uh, fundamental assumptions like materialism, uh, determinism, uh, reductionism also. So applied to um, mind and brain, it means that, for instance, um, everything in the universe uh, is only matter and energy, therefore, the brain is a physical object too, and uh, the mind can be reduced strictly to uh, electrical and chemical processes um, in the brain. Uh, it means also that um, everything is determined from uh, a material or physical point of view. So uh, we don't have any uh, freedom. Uh, we're like biological robots, uh, totally determined by uh, our neurons and our genes and so on and so forth. And uh, so we are reduced to uh, material objects <clears throat> and we are determined by material processes. Uh, so that's the what we call the modern uh, scientific worldview. But, uh, right, but Dr. Dr. Beauregard, is that really where science is at? Because I think that one of the problems that kind of the people on the street, if you will, folks that I talk to who are not engaged in this debate, 
they kind of take a view of it kind of the way that a lot of folks in America and in North America treat uh, Catholicism or even Christianity. It's like, yeah, 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 kind of, but I don't really hold to all that. Uh, do, do most people really believe any of that? And to what extent is that really the mainstream view within science? Well, it, it's the mainstream view, uh, I would say, uh, still in the biomedical field. It is also uh, in philosophy. However, in physics, everything changed uh, about 100 years ago. So they've had their own revolution from classical physics to quantum physics, and they dematerialized the world. So the quantum physicists, the founding fathers of quantum physics, realized that you know, the, the, the world, the universe, is not constituted of uh, tiny uh, f physical particles, like billiard balls, for instance, but the uh, they, they realize that um, there's a very important mental component in the universe, uh, and this relates to the uh, the so-called uh, measurement problem or the observer effect. So the the physicist and his instrument uh, they are influencing to a certain extent the outcome of the uh, experiment at a microphysical level. Uh, whether they are measuring uh, either particles or, or waves. And so the, 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 now it's uh, recognized uh, in quantum physics that you cannot explain uh, the universe or understand the universe without making reference to what we call mind and uh, consciousness. But in, bio, in the biomedical field, uh, including neuroscience, it's a different ballgame. Uh, most Scientists in uh, my field of research, for instance, are not aware of these. Uh, or they, they, they don't know very well quantum physics, and they are not aware that, that there's been a revolution 100 years ago regarding these uh, fundamental issues. And it's, it's the same thing pretty much also in other fields, like uh, psychiatry, for instance. So it's, uh, we, we find a lot of uh, biological reductionism in psychiatry. As, uh, especially with regard to um, the use of drugs, for instance, and um, so on and so forth. And so uh, in philosophy, it's the same thing still. So even though uh, physicists have shown that the universe cannot be reduced to uh, a physical machine uh, nearly 100 years ago, um, the uh, most scientists and philosophers are either not aware of that or they don't want to. Uh, you know, they don't want to accept that. But don't we have to be a little bit careful when we tread into the physicist territory and quantum physics in particular? Because there's a lot of pushback. There's a whole tsunami of pushback on the, the, the way that quantum physics has been kind of weaved into a lot of new age thought. And I'm not saying at all that that's what you're doing, but I think there's a lot of fuzziness there. I think what we can say at the very least is that it's clearly an unsettled issue, and we have to take seriously the thought that that quantum physics suggests that consciousness may be fundamental in the way that we generally think of matter as being fundamental. So I'm with you on all that. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly my point, yes. Yeah, I just don't want to get into that whole battle of you know, whether the observer effect really is and whether shut up and calculate and all that kind of stuff. I just think, but I do think we can't shy away from it. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about your book is you don't shy away from anything. But we can't shy away from the fact that quantum physics may very well be best interpreted as being supportive of these ideas that you're talking about. But let me switch gears for a minute because what I really, mm -hmm. one of the things I want to focus on, and I just mentioned it, I really appreciate that you're clear right from the start about talking in these kind of military terms. It's a brain war. It's a battle over science. <laughs> so yeah. I want to spend a good deal of time talking about the book and the particular <clears throat> issues mm -hmm. that you bring up, because I think, as you just said, one thing it does is it, how easily falsifiable some of the materialist positions are. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I want to understand, I want you to tell us why 
we are in this war at the end of the day, why there is this battle, because I think a lot of folks tune into the fact that there's a, a war, that there is a battle, but they don't get it. I mean, so mm-hmm. you've done these experiments that find that people can control their brain. So what? Why is there a war? Why is there a battle? Well, because there's a, a commitment to a certain form of ideology in uh, mainstream science. Why? Uh, Why is there such a commitment? Why? Because at at, uh, the beginning, of, at the birth of modern science, the the scientists decided to uh, keep a certain distance from the church, the power of the church, understandably. And that uh, has helped, you know, science to uh, evolve, you know, to, to make great progress. But at the same time, uh, the, the the founding fathers of uh, modern science rejected, in a certain sense, uh, the domain of subjectivity, uh, the first-person perspective, the mental experiences. These things were considered uh, to be um, only secondary qualities, and the uh, at the beginning they thought uh, that these things were not that important. They, they decided to focus more on the physical, uh, you know, the physical world, matter as they called that. And so this, this point of view uh, became dominant, made progress uh, during the following centuries, during the 17th and 18th century. And in the 19th century, um, this uh, materialist and reductionist point of view became synonymous with science. And um, in the 20th century, it, was, uh, it started to be challenged first by uh, quantum physics, but other, also in other uh, domains. Um, but we are now at the beginning of the 21st century, and this view is still considered to be the, you know, the norm, the standard. Uh, it, it's the mainstream view <clears throat> because it's based on a number of beliefs, assumptions, like I, we said before. Uh, but for, for, for a long time, these assumptions seemed to explain very well uh, the uh, phenomena that were under investigations. However, now there's increasing evidence showing that a number of uh, phenomena do not fit within this uh, conventional uh, materialist physicalist uh, framework. They cannot be explained very well by this framework. And this is exactly what I'm discussing in uh, my book, uh, Brain Wars. And I think you do a wonderful job of it. I want to get to that data. I just want to drill into this point a little bit further because Mm -hmm. I think having covered this with a lot of different people, I think there's something a little bit deeper going on. And that's there's a comfort level that we all have with our consumerism, our materialism, our society Mm -hmm. that we've built. And it's a wonderful, wonderful society, especially when we look back historically at how much people have struggled just to barely survive. And we look at all the things that we have and the cars and the airplanes and the iPhones and all that. And we are so enmeshed in this materialism that is both consumer materialism, but also Mm -hmm. scientific materialism that I think it's very, very uh, scary is the only word I can think of for folks to mm-hmm. contemplate anything else. How could we could we really maintain our way of life that we've all come, become so comfortable with? That we're better than this other country. Yeah. That we have a right to <laughs> to kind of starve that other country, deprive them of mm-hmm. of money, of oil, of food, whatever it is. Can we really maintain that if we take the mm-hmm. long-term, larger picture view of what it would mean to be post-materialistic, both from a consumer standpoint, but also from a scientific standpoint? Don't the issues get really big, really quick when you think this thing through? Yes, that's that's a very good point. I agree with your analysis. But there's something else also. Um you, scientists are humans, and humans have their own belief systems, and they become attached in the long term with their belief systems. So uh, scientists, a number of scientists, have been, uh, you know, have believed uh, very much in this uh, materialist uh, view for centuries, and uh, so it's like uh, it, it has become a central dogma 
in various fields, including neuroscience. So it's it's um, very dangerous. It's scary for a number of people if you're starting to challenge this mainstream uh, uh, dogma, the central dogma. You know, it's it's a little bit like in uh, any other domains of uh, society, including religion. Uh, if you threaten uh, the belief of specific, uh, you know, religious groups, then you might be in trouble, and that's exactly what we see also in uh, in science. But at a certain point, when the so-called anomalous data accumulate, there comes a, a point where uh, the old paradigm cannot resist anymore. And I believe that now we are in a, a sort of a transition period toward a new paradigm. So there, there, the next scientific revolution should be about mind and consciousness, in my view. Very good. Well, I think you do a nice job in the book of kind of pointing out how dramatic the par the existing paradigm is frayed at the edges. And I like the way you start and tie together a lot of science that we all think we're very familiar with and we're comfortable with, and you show us how that really violates this scientific materialism that we've all come become so accepting of. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about, for example, the placebo effect and also hypnosis and how these two areas and chap there are chapters in your book where you do a very nice job of breaking bringing people through some of the research in a very accessible way but tell us the placebo effect and and hypnosis how those violate the a very strict understanding of reductionist materialism yeah well for for, for a number of uh, materialist thinkers and scientists uh, the mind is totally powerless, doesn't have any, uh, cannot exert any power on what's going on at the brain level and also in the body. Can you break that down and explain why that would have to be true if you were a strict scientific materialist? There are a number of materialist positions. So this is uh, a, a position that is called epiphenomenalism. So it means that uh, the, the, these... Uh, these proponents recognize that my mental processes uh, do exist, but they are powerless. They don't have any, uh, they cannot exert any influence. So that's one position. But you have other position like uh, eliminative reductionism. So, so you're trying to eliminate uh, all mental processes like philosopher Daniel Dennett or the, uh, the Churchlands, for instance. So they will say that consciousness and all the other mental processes are simply illusion that the only thing that exists is uh, electrochemical activity uh, in the brain. <clears throat> so if this is true, then of course you cannot influence uh, the activity of your brain by your beliefs, your expectations, you see. But that is exactly what the, the, the placebo demonstrates, that uh, your beliefs and expectations about uh, a false, uh, fake treatment can significantly alter uh, what's happening in the brain and also in the physiological systems connected uh, to the brain. Um, so, for instance, during the last decade, uh, th there have been uh, several brain imaging studies about the placebo effect. And in some cases, for instance, there was a very interesting uh, study done at the University of British Columbia. Uh, they did uh, a study to measure the impact of a placebo treatment on uh, people suffering from a severe form of uh, Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, there's a, a great level of destruction of the nerve cells, the neuron producing a chemical messenger that we call dopamine. Dopamine is the key uh, chemical messenger in motor function, but it's also involved in many other uh, activities. Uh, but in that specific case, the, uh, the patients at a, a level of destruction of about 70 to 80 percent. Uh, so the, the, the level of destruction of the nerve cells producing dopamine was quite high. And uh, of course, they were severely impaired from a, a clinical point of view. They had trouble to move. They were experiencing a lot of tremors. And so the, the neurologist doing the, the study presented them uh, a fake treatment. It was only distilled water. But they, they told the patients that this was potentially a, a revolutionary treatment, a new treatment for Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, following the injection, after a few minutes, they, they scanned them with 
technology that we call functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. <clears throat> Uh, pardon me, in that specific case, it was positron emission tomography. So they were interested in measuring the activity of dopamine uh, in the brain. And so very rapidly, uh, those patients who most believed in the, the fake treatment, which was distilled water, they started to produce uh, dopamine and to release dopamine in their brains uh, in amount comparable to that seen in young, healthy people. And in parallel, uh, they started to get much better from a clinical point of view. So they had less tremors, um, they had more strength, and so uh, and they were more uh, optimistic, at least for a certain period of time. So this this is a very nice uh, illustration of the power of what we call mind, and by mind I mean all the mental activity, mental events, and in that specific case, uh, this effect is related simply to the the beliefs and also the expectations that the patients had regarding uh, the, the fake treatment. So it's a, a very nice illustration. Another interesting case is that of hypnosis. So it's, uh, hypnosis is based on the suggestions uh, coming from an hypnotist and the, the subject of the experiment accept the, uh, the suggestions. Um, Nowadays, the uh, experts in this field of research consider that all forms of hypnosis are, in reality, self-hypnosis. That means that if the subject does not want to accept the suggestions from the hypnotist, uh, it won't work. Um, so, the, again, during the last decade, there's been a number of uh, brain imaging studies that have been done simply to measure whether really there's something happening uh, at the brain level because uh, skeptics have been arguing for a long time that um, hypnosis is simply wishful thinking. That it's only uh, based on social compliance from the, uh, the, the subjects. You only want to please the uh, hypnotist, but there's nothing else. So uh, several research teams have uh, attempted to research this question using brain imaging and for instance, there was a very interesting study that done at Harvard. Um, they were inter the researchers uh, were looking for the, um, the neural correlates of uh, color vision. So neural correlates uh, uh, are uh, physical processes in the brain, whether electrical or chemical, that are related to a specific mental activity. For instance, uh, it can be perception, perception of color. So in that case, they, uh, they scan the subjects, uh, highly uh, hypnotizable subjects, which means that these people had the uh, capacity to uh, enter quite easily into uh, a trance state uh, deep enough. And so they, these, these subjects were able to, um, uh, to imagine that they were looking or seeing different types of pattern colors in accordance with the suggestions of the, the researchers doing the study. And so uh, it was very interesting because the, when they were presenting uh, stimuli that were colored, but the researchers were telling the, uh, the subjects that the, these stimuli were uh, only gray, the, uh, the brain regions uh, associated with the treatment, the processing of color in the brain were not activated. <clears throat> even though the stimuli were colored. And, uh, and the reverse effect was also measured, was also observed in the study. That is, uh, when there was no color in the stimuli, uh, there was still activation in the uh, regions of the brain processing colors. Um, so again, this is a very nice illustration that what's going on at the minor level can exert a great influence over what's happening uh, in terms of brain activity. Right, exactly. Like I said, you do a very nice job in the book, and I really encourage folks to get, to get the book, whether you're a skeptic or a proponent or whatever, just a person interested in science. I think you'll enjoy the way that you bring forth this research, and you really document in a way that's easy, accessible. You do have the nice uh, annotations, references to the research if people mm -hmm. want to go look it up, but that's all there. So the question then remains, 
So why are we still having a war? You've you've just now <laughs> linked up for us two things that we already were pretty accepting of. Hey, we all have heard mm-hmm. of the placebo effect. We know that every study, every pharmaceutical study, every scientific study has to allow for a placebo effect. So they must recognize that there's some reality to it. And hypnosis has become so common that I think at least one out of three people have had some kind of hypnosis while at the dentist or someplace else. So given that we accept these modalities, these treatments, these understandings that violate strict materialism, why are we still in the battle? Why do we still have the war? Well, because uh, a number of scientists considered that you can interpret these phenomena using a strictly uh, materialist framework. How do they do that? What, what would be the... Well, they, they will say that, um, for instance, you can reduce uh, the beliefs and the expectations of a patient regarding uh, the fake treatment to um, electrical and chemical activity in specific portions of the brain. So what they are saying, essentially, is that it's the brain acting upon the brain. There's no, you don't need uh, mental, uh, you know, functions uh, apart from the brain to explain this kind of phenomenon. That's what they say. But doesn't that kind of result in some kind of recursive logic that at the end of the day gets into all sorts of other problems? I mean, what, what, what is the starting point in their explanation for such an activity. It gets into the whole neuroplasticity argument. You know, I mean, like if we show that neuroplasticity is real and that we can rewire our brain and, and you've done some research on this as well and yes, published yes. some work on this, yeah. then doesn't it ultimately lead to the question of, well, then what was the beginning point and wasn't there some observer, some consciousness that might have started this process? Yeah, but for for them, the neuroplasticity is simply the brain uh, rewiring itself. Again, they want um, they don't need uh, you know consciousness and other mental functions to explain that. That's what they say, but uh, I t- I don't think it's um, it's good explanation uh, because you know the brain doesn't uh, the brain to me will respond to the um, the expectations or the beliefs. And so if your uh, beliefs are negative about uh, fake treatment, bogus treatment, then you will experience something totally different. So uh, in terms of the chemical messengers involved in the response, and so it's called the nocebo effect, uh, it's exactly the reverse. So you, you need uh, a person and a consciousness in order to produce phenomenon like that. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense at all because the brain itself is quite neutral. So you can influence it in a way or in other. For instance, we've done a, another brain imaging studies, a positron emission uh, tomography study. And uh, in that case, we measured the activity uh, of serotonin, which is in, uh, very much involved in uh, mood regulation, <clears throat> and also in the emotions, a lot of emotions. And uh, so we ask our subjects to simply um, remember and try to reenact the saddest episode of their lives. And we, we uh, add another condition in which we ask the same thing, but this time they had to uh, reenact the happiest moment of their lives. And in a matter of only a few minutes, we measured uh, either increases in terms of serotonin production or decrease, increases in the positive, uh, the, the happy state, and decreases in the negative state, the sad state, uh, within a few minutes <clears throat> in regions of the brain related to uh, emotions and mood regulation. You see, so this shows really that the content itself of the, uh, the mental processes their nature will influence the direction that the uh, brain activity will take. Um, so that's why I'm claiming that it's not possible to interpret this, this kind of phenomenon without you know, uh, recognizing the existence of uh, mental processes. It certainly seems a lot cleaner but it seems rather obvious. What about this argument? And you'll hear this sometimes too. What about folks who say, okay, 
just because you've shown that maybe this strict materialism as you've defined it doesn't work in this situation, maybe there's something else down the road that quote-unquote science will discover that will explain this. We don't need to jump to this idea of there being a you inside your head, there being consciousness, there being dualism, no matter what word you want to throw at it. We don't need to jump off of the ship that we're on just yet, just because we have this finding. Well, how do you respond to that? Well, it's, yeah, this is called promissory materialism. And uh, this concept uh, was uh, proposed by um, a famous philosopher of science, Karl Popper, uh, in the 20th century. And, uh, but Popper analyzed the text of the materialists uh, across a number of centuries. And uh, the funny thing is that he realized that they were exactly saying the same thing 300, uh, 300 years ago, or 200 years ago, or 100 years ago. So they've always been uh, arguing this. Uh, and so that, that's uh, one aspect of the thing. But now we have evidence um, showing, in my view, that this, this uh, materialist outlook is simply wrong. It's false. And I'm referring here to um, the, the studies about the, the so-called near-death uh, phenomenon, near-death experience phenomenon, especially during cardiac arrest. Why is this is important? Because during cardiac arrest, there's a, the blood flow to the brain will cease uh, following a number of seconds, usually quite rapidly. And the, if you're measuring electrical activity in the brain using an EEG or electroencephalograph, the EEG will become flat within 10 to 20 seconds usually. So in that kind of state, according to mainstream neuroscience, higher mental functions are not possible. Yet, during the last uh, 10 years, I think there's been four or five different studies documenting over 100 cases of patients who, re who reported conscious mental activity uh, during a state of cardiac arrest. <clears throat> so this is quite uh, interesting. Um, and it's very hard for materialists, scientists, or philosophers to uh, interpret this kind of phenomenon. Yes, indeed. And you know we've covered that topic extensively on this show. And, yes. But I do like the way that you summed it up there, and the way that you sum it up in your book is quite nice. So let's get on to the other elephant in the room here. Dr. Beauregard, <laughs> one of the criticisms of your work, and it's sometimes made explicitly and sometimes just subtly implied, mm -hmm. is that you're pushing some kind of, you're peddling some kind of Christian agenda. You really are trying to convert people to some kind of religion. How do you respond to that? Well, I would say that uh, this is not true at all, because I'm not, I'm not religious at all. I don't have any religious affiliation. Uh, so uh, this is uh, funny to, uh, to hear. Uh, however, I, would, I consider myself to be a spiritual person, but... Um, I'm not pushing any religious agenda here. I don't have any ties with uh, religious organizations. Great. And I'm glad you had a chance to get that out there because I think it's often subtly implied and sometimes not even so subtly implied that that's uh -huh. what's really going on here. And at the well, same that's time... That's totally false. Oh, good. That's totally false. <laughs> good. Be because at the same time, though, I think there's we can be too reactionary the other way. Because mm -hmm. we have to, I think, and I'd love to, I'm just throwing out my opinion, I really want to get your opinion, but I don't think we can play down the spiritual implications of some of this work. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, the near-death experience science, we yes. can look at it purely uh, analytically from the science standpoint, and we can say, wow, mm -hmm. this looks like there's something there, and we would be very inclined then to take the next step in terms of what they're telling us about spirituality and how it does link back, at least in some mm -hmm. general way, to some of the wisdom traditions and religions that we've had over time. So what is your thought on that? Do we need to go there? Do we need to say hey, there are some spiritual implications here that may have to be dealt with once we cross this chasm to a post-materialistic world, or do we just kind of keep our nose to the grindstone and ignore all that and just pretend like it's all just about materialism? 
No, no, uh, I, I can. I agree with you uh, because if, uh, uh, of course, when we speak of uh, so-called near-death experience during uh, cardiac arrest, for instance, the people usually are reanimated within a few minutes, uh, usually two to three, four minutes, because they cannot stay in that kind of state for a long, long time without, uh, you know, severe cerebral damage. <clears throat> so. And when they, they report something about their uh, transcendental component of their experience, uh, whether it's being a meeting with a beautiful being of flight or meeting with deceased friends or relatives and so on and so forth, that, from a scientific point of view, we cannot validate it or not. We can only uh, attempt to validate what they report from a perceptual point of view. So the, um, the out-of-body component of this experience that can be uh, corroborated by external source and it's been done in a few cases um, by members of the medical staff um, so but of course like you said what they are reporting from a subjective point of view seems to um, you know validate some spiritual traditions seems to uh, provide certain evidence that there might be uh, spiritual realms out there. Uh, uh, and, I, so, and I'm open-minded to this kind of suggestion. And like I said, I'm a spiritual person, and um, uh, <clears throat> this would not surprise me at all if there's a, there are a multitude of spiritual realms that we don't know yet. Um, and I don't think it's, it's not scientific to uh, have that kind of point of view. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's human, isn't it? I mean, that's the part I think yeah, we have yeah. to acknowledge that these are yeah. fundamental human questions that the whole mm -hmm. endeavor of science, that's why it came yes. about, was to understand yeah. who we are, what place we are, what place we have in the universe, mm -hmm. what happens to us when we die. These are the ultimate questions. So I, I think that this couldn't be more fairly put that these are real concerns that we all have. We have to acknowledge that. Yes, and also uh, spiritual experiences have been reported across all uh, traditions, uh, cultures, and since the beginning of time. You know, so uh, they, they really do exist from a subjective point of view. Now we don't have the, uh, of course, we don't have a scientific explanation for the, these experiences yet, but... Uh, what I'm saying is that we, we need to remain uh, open-minded regarding this aspect. Very good. Near the end of your book, Brain Wars, you talk about a shift in consciousness. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to talk about that and whether you really yeah. think, number one, that is likely, that can come about. We are so enmeshed. We are so married to this materialism. Can we really get beyond it? And question two related to that is, how might that come about? Is it going to be an evolutionary change or does it require a radical revolutionary shift? Uh, well, there's a, I, could, I, could, I can say that at least in my own field, there's an increasing number of scientists uh, and also in other disciplines challenging the old uh, materialist uh, worldview. So it's done not only by um, scientists, but also by philosophers themselves. So in the last few years, we've seen books uh, came out, you know, about the waning of materialism and so on and so forth. And so now uh, several different scientists are starting to question this. Uh, so, so we're in a transition period, like I said before. And uh, in certain circles, uh, scientists are uh, creating a sort of uh, union. We're getting together. We're trying to get organized. Um, and, uh, for instance, there's a, a special issue of uh, a journal, which a mainstream journal in neuroscience called Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. And next year, there will be a special issue about the possibility of non-local mind. And this is a sign of time, because only 10 years ago or 15, 20 years ago, this would have not been possible at all. So now it's becoming possible to discuss these important issues publicly and even to challenge the mainstream view openly, overtly. So th this was not possible at all before. 
<clears throat> so there's there's a progress uh, regarding this uh, this uh, evolution in our field, um, and so so I think that um, there eventually will be uh, another revol- a big revolution in science, uh, and this will uh, be about uh, mind and consciousness and the same kind of. Uh, revolution that they've had uh, about 100 years ago in physics, from classical physics to quantum physics, will have the, probably the same, um, you know, in our own field. Uh, and uh, at the same time, in parallel, of course, like you said at the beginning of the interview, if you talk to lay people, uh, to most people, they do not believe that they are strictly biological robots, that they don't have any influence over their brain activity or what's happening in the body and so on and so forth. And so it won't be difficult uh, if there's uh, the the, the start of really a a transition in science, within science, uh, it will go uh, quickly uh, because the rest of the world, um, you know, is very sympathetic regarding a non-materialist view of uh, consciousness and of human life of the universe. Right, right. Very good. Very good point. So, Dr. Borgard, tell us a little bit about the research that you're currently engaged in. And also, if you want to tell us anything else we can find out about the book, that'd be great, too. So what are you working on nowadays? Well, I'm doing uh, I'm doing uh, brain imaging uh, experiments regarding uh, some types of altered, well, altered states of consciousness and especially uh, spiritual uh, consciousness. Uh, so, so that's one thing. I'm also uh, investigating uh, the, the capacity of um, the human mind to influence uh, or to control the activity of regions involved in uh, emotional responses. So it's called emotion regulation. So that's, that's uh, one aspect. But uh, from a theoretical point of view, I'm also uh, in the process of developing a new theory about uh, the role and the impact of mind and consciousness uh, in nature. Great. Well, you want to tip your hand a little bit and tell us what you're thinking in general? Terms? Well, the, uh, I'm planning to present this uh, this theory in this special issue that will be published next year in the um, Frontiers of in Human Neuroscience. Um, and well, the basic ideas about that it's uh, mind consciousness are ir- irreducible; they cannot be reduced to matter. They are fundamental uh, in the universe as much as the fundamental forces of physics. Um, and the uh, you know the so so they are as important at, as what we call space, time, and also the uh, the physical world. And so what I'm planning to do is simply to demonstrate that from uh, an empirical point of view. So I'm presenting a series of empirical evidence showing that um, mental processes and events uh, exert a great influence um, within the body, the brain and body, uh, but also outside of the physical body, uh, beyond the confines of the brain and the body. <clears throat> so, in essence, that's the uh, the gist of it. Wow! Well, that's exciting. That's a great teaser for the for the upcoming article, and we'll certainly look for that. You know what? The the, the good news is that when I'm presenting these things, um, you know, to uh, for instance, can be Department of Psychiatry or even to some neuroscientist, and these days now they are more willing to listen, you know, and to reflect about these things and. Like I said before, 10 years ago, this would not have been possible at all. So it's a sign that things are starting to change, really. Right. That's very interesting to hear from someone who's on the front line of this work like you are. I I really value that opinion, and I think folks will, will take heart in that. So the book, again, is Brain Wars, The Scientific Battle Over the Existence of the Mind and the Proof That Will Change the Way We Live Our Lives. Dr. Mario Beauregard, thank you again so much for joining me today on Skeptico. Thanks very much, Alex. Thanks again to Dr. Mario Beauregard for joining me today on Skeptico. A couple of questions I'd tee up from this interview. The first would have to do with the placebo effect. I haven't really talked a lot about the placebo effect on this show, but I think Dr. Beauregard does a nice job of showing how it, too, 
adds to the mounting evidence against scientific materialism. So I'd be interested to hear how you pull that apart and how you process some of the research that he's pointing to in that area. And the second question would be returning to a topic we talk about frequently, and that is the paradigm shift. So Dr. Beauregard is suggesting that, hey, things really are moving in the right direction, and that this science, which seems pretty self-evident to most of us, is gaining traction. I'd like to think that's true, but I think embedded in that belief is a misunderstanding of just how powerful the forces that would resist that really are. And the fact that they haven't really been challenged to a great degree right now makes it hard to estimate just how hard their pushback might be. Anyways, I'm tipping my hand as to my take on that, but I think it'd be interesting to dredge that up and debate that one more time. And the place to do that, of course, is either in the forum or on the comment section of the website. The website address, again, is S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O dot com. So there you'll find a link to the forum, or you can add your comment right there on the website. And you'll also find links to all of our almost 200 previous shows. So be sure to check that out and connect with us. Let us know your thoughts on the show, and in particular, on these topics that Dr. Beauregard has brought to us. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. I have a number of interesting shows coming up. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.